Hi everyone, my name is Elena Comelli and I'm an assistant professor and the Lawson Family Chair in Microbiome Nutrition Research at the Department of Nutritional Sciences and the Center for Child Nutrition and Health at the University of Toronto. In my lab, we are interested in the interaction between diet and the microbiome, and in particular, how we could use diet and its beneficial effects on the microbiome in order to prevent and reduce the risk for chronic diseases. We have an interest specifically on vitamin D and the probiotics, but I'm going to discuss the probiotics with you today. So the field of the microbiome, it's a rapidly evolving field, and so it's, uh, it's a vocabulary. Therefore, I wanted to give you, just as a start, a few definitions that are becoming, of words that are becoming more and more used in the field. So by microbiota, we refer to the assemblage of microorganisms that are present in a defined environment. While the metagenome is the collection of their genomes and genes, and the microbiome refers to the entire habitat, including the microorganisms, their genome, and the surrounding environment. So in this novel view, we should consider ourselves as supraorganisms, whose genome is the sum of the genes in our own home Homo sapiens genome and the metagenome. So there are various microbial communities that are associated with various body sites, but the one that is most diverse and that uh, comprises the most abundant number of microorganisms is the gut-associated microbiota. So this community resides, as its name says, in the GI tract, in the gastrointestinal tract, and it consists of 10 to the 14th microorganisms. These are variously distributed in a region-specific manner, as this slide shows, and their density, so their lumina concentration, increases along the cephalocaudal axis. So despite that, when we conduct clinical studies, the easiest samples, the most easily accessible sample that we can work with is a fecal sample. So most of our knowledge has been developed about the microbiota of stools, which is considered to be a representation of what is found within the intestinal tract. What is remarkable about this gut microbiota is that it, uh, it comprises microorganisms that stem from the three domains of life, including bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotic microorganisms, as well as viruses. These figures here are meant to show you and give you an idea of the composition of uh, the bacteria uh, microbiota, the archaea community, and the virome. And I'd like you to focus now on the bacteria community, which is mainly represented by four dominant phyla, here illustrated by four different colors, the firmicutes, the bacteroideres, the actinobacteria, and the proteobacteria. The archaea represents about 10% of the total microbes. They're not present in all of the individuals, but when they are, they include the microorganisms that are responsible for methane generation. And these methanogens, so-called methanogens, use the product of bacteria fermentation to produce methane. Now, this diverse community is acquired gradually during postnatal life, and particularly during early stages of life. As you can see from this slide, the four main phyla that I mentioned earlier are represented by four different colors as a function of age. And it's really winning that the major shifts occur and the microbiome is reshaped to um, acquire a composition that will remain stable throughout adulthood. Now, this microbiome is localized within the intestinal lumen or in association with the mucosa, but never in direct association, in contact with the intestinal epithelium. There will always be a mucous layer that physically separates these bacteria or other microorganisms from the epithelium. So this is what it's typical of a healthy situation, which is represented by the top picture, where you can see a layer, a mucous layer that physically separates the bacterial in the lumen from the underlying epithelium, why in disease situations such as in ulcerative colitis, this mucous layer may be interrupted, allowing for direct contact between the microorganisms and the intestinal cells, which may result into an inflammation response. Now, the microbiota has multiple roles, and I alluded to fermentation earlier, and this, in fact, is one of the main roles that it has. So it has the role of nutrient generation and processing, and therefore contributes to energy homeostasis. So these microbes ferment 
for example, dietary polysaccharides that would, we would be unable to digest, as well as protein compounds that may reach the colon and produce nutrients such as the short-chain fatty acids that are then absorbed through the, um, through the intestine. So in this perspective, the intestinal microbiome is considered as an additional metabolic organ of our body. And think about that the short-chain fatty acids uh, represent 8 to 10 percent of our total caloric intake. The microbiota also participates into intestinal ontogeny and is a critical player in the intestinal barrier function, so it's important for the intestinal defense system. Now, a series of disease disorders and conditions have been found to be associated with an altered microbiota, or as it is referred to, a dysbiotic, different from healthy gut microbiota composition. All of these diseases are listed here, and really this builds up a rationale for using the microbiota or considering the microbiota as a therapeutic target, and to consider this both in terms of prevention and treatment. So diet can play a critical role in this because diet is one of the major factors that affects the composition of the gut microbiota together with other factors that are represented on this slide. So today we'll particularly discuss the probiotic as a dietary approach. So what are probiotics? Probiotics are live microorganisms which when administered in adequate amount confer a health benefit on the host. This is a definition that was put forward by the World Health Organization in 2001 and is accepted quite globally by several regulatory agencies. So several different kinds of probiotic species and strains have been tested for different conditions and also in the healthy population. And there is consensus among the experts, which is based on the randomized control trials and meta-analysis that have been conducted, so that consumption of probiotics could be recommended in a list of conditions and, and, that, and disorders that are listed here. So this includes the prevention of upper respiratory tract infections, the treatment of infectious diarrhea, prevention of hypercholesterolemia, management of constipation, and so on. So for these conditions, there could be already recommendation in clinical practice to be made. Specifically, if we want to focus on prevention at earlier stages of life, so in children, probiotics can be considered within a prophylactic protocol in the context of allergic disease, colic, and respiratory and intestinal infections. So what is to be kept in mind is that different species can have different effects. So when recommending in clinical practice, it's really important that the species are checked so that the correct one is recommended for the benefit that is intended to be uh, meant for. So there are several mechanisms that have been described explaining the probiotic beneficial effects. Several of these are widespread and common among most of the probiotics that have been studied and are those that lay at the bottom of this uh, in this figure. Some others are more of the species specific mechanisms such as for example vitamin B synthesis and other are more strain specific such as uh, those uh, immunomodulatory effects. So this is important to keep in mind for when we want to recommend probiotic consumption and also from the regulatory perspective for when we need to substantiate claim that would accompany the inclusion of probiotics in functional food. So currently in Health Canada for what pertains functional foods, so I'm not talking about supplements, probiotic can be included and can be the inclusion of this probiotic if they belong to this list of 16 species. Their inclusion can be accompanied by one of the four claims that Health Canada has approved. Now this claim refer, refer to core benefits of probiotics, which is why they are co it's common to all of the 16 species, and refers to their uh, beneficial effects in terms of um, sustaining a health compatible composition of the microbiota. Finally, a few words about safety. So safe probiotics are safe for use. This is based on several randomized control trials that have been conducted with pregnant women, infants, and children of various ages. Currently, though, it's recommended that caution is taken with immune compromised subjects and those that are at risk of microbial translocation. And to end this lecture, I would just want to provide you a few resources and references for those of you who are interested in discovering more about the field of probiotics.